Hello, and welcome to Chasing Leviathan, the podcast where we pursue big questions. My goal today is to listen and learn just a little bit more. As we head into our conversation, let me invite you to chase life's biggest questions with me, one episode at a time. Kind of as we we start here, can you uh, tell me a little bit about uh, yourself? How did you get interested in philosophy? And specifically, how did you get interested in philosophy of science? Silent. <laughs> how did you get interested in philosophy of science? And uh, what made you, you know, I, I see that you wrote a tapestry of values, an introduction to values in science. And this seems almost like a distillation of that with this uh, Elements book, um, which has just come out uh, through Cambridge. Um, again, values in science, right? Uh, I think this topic is one super important. So thank you for coming on today. Um, so when you talk about big questions, I mean, I think that's really important, but I'd love to hear your journey into this world. Yeah, I'm happy to. So as an undergrad, I, um, plan to go on and become a, a chemistry professor. Actually, I was a chemistry major. I did complete a chemistry major. Um, but um, as I was, so to be honest, as I was doing like undergraduate research projects each summer, um, I realized uh, I'm not super great at lab work in chemistry. And also after like maybe two or three weeks of like a 10 week research program, I would be getting bored. I'd be feeling like, oh, this is repetitive. <laughs> um, and then I had a, a roommate who was taking I had no idea what philosophy was when I uh, went into college and had a roommate who was taking an intro to philosophy class. And I realized, wow, this seems really interesting. I like these big questions. And um, started thinking, you know, so I, I, you know, I took intro to philosophy, then I started taking some more philosophy courses, and thought, um, you know, connecting the philosophy with the science would be really interesting. I was interested in, um, you know, sort of big uh, questions about, you know, how science relates to society, how science relates to religion, you know, lots of big questions there. And um, so I ultimately, when I graduated, I tried an internship in um, computational chemistry. My uh, professor said, well, maybe if you don't have to be in the lab, if you're just doing stuff with the computer, maybe you'll like it better. Um, but I still thought the philosophy was so much more fun. And I started taking some graduate classes in philosophy. And so then I did my PhD in the history of science and philosophy of science, um, but really focusing more on the philosophy. And um, anyway, um, and then at, at that point, I started discovering um, that, you know, philosophers of science will ask a lot of different kinds of questions about science. They'll ask about, you know, um, what counts as a good scientific explanation, what counts as a good model or a good theory, um, you know, what does objectivity in science involve? But I realized that I really kind of liked the kind of the social connections of science. And this has come to sort of typically be framed as a matter of what roles that values play in science. And so, um, you know, that kind of became my research area. And, um, and, and it, I just found that, you know, a lot of the work um, being done in this area had been written kind of for other scholars, you know, in journal articles and so on. And I do really enjoy trying to make these ideas accessible to other, you know, people who might not be experts to undergraduates or um, to, you know, scientists. I find it really fulfilling to talk to scientists about this kind of work. And, um, so anyway, my Tapestry of Values book, I came up with this idea, well, maybe I can write kind of an introduction that's accessible to a broad audience that my undergraduate science majors might find interesting. Um, I'm also um, partly appointed in a department of fisheries and wildlife at Michigan State University. People find that very humorous because A, I don't know anything about fishing or hunting and B, you know, it doesn't seem like the place where you'd have a philosopher. Um, but anyway, we can talk more about how I ended up there if it comes. I would up. love to hear but, that. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, um, so I also tested the manuscript for that out on my graduate students in fisheries and wildlife to see, you know, does this resonate with them? So anyway, so I had that book. Um, but then um, I got this invitation to write this most recent book, Values in Science for Cambridge, 
Um, and um, they're designed to be these short um, volumes, you know, uh, you know, twenty to thirty thousand words, rather than a normal, you know, big book. And um, and and what's fun about this is it's an opportunity to kind of take this literature and again make it accessible, but really sort of go into sort of the philosophy, the philosophical details that I actually kind of tried to avoid more in my tapestry book. There I focus more on case studies. Um, but for somebody who actually wants to know the arguments that philosophers have been using, um, I, I go ahead and lay those out, but again, trying to make it very accessible in the values and science book. So, so now I, I'm all excited. I feel like I've got an introductory book for sort of the scientific community and an introductory book for people who want a little bit more of the philosophy. And um, so it's kind of a, a fun duo. Uh, I really loved reading the elements and I, I'll definitely have to check out the, the tapestry of, of values, but the, uh, the element uh, values and science was very clear. Uh, as someone who has some philosophical training, I was like, I, I really appreciated how concise and yet I, I was I felt like I was learning every step of the way. And I think even for people who don't have philosophical training, I think you did a great job. There's gonna be some, you know, there's just some heavy lifting when it comes to like reading words like epistemic and non epistemic. <laughs> right. But that's not too but it's not that hard, right? Like it's right. something like I, I feel like I could give that to someone who is willing to do some work and they could, you know, it's not like handing them uh I had a professor who I loved very much, and he was very much in favor of letting people study what they wanted. Hmm. And uh, I did not know what the work was. And uh, he let me read uh, Truth and Method by Hans Jörg Gadamer, Cold Turkey. And <laughs> it was, I, I will say, it really changed the trajectory of uh, what I was interested in. And it was really good. But that was, I mean, that was months. <laughs> <laughs> about 20 pages a day and i just the words started for the first time in my life i started to have that experience of, like the words blurring on the page i was like what is happening <laughs> wow so this is not like that you did a great job really of providing um yeah i and i i i have a lot of thoughts about i it's a lot of secondary sources don't actually i think a lot of times obfuscate is that the word obfuscate obfuscate um, yeah 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 the what what they're actually trying to teach you know and i i often do better reading the primary sources but i felt like you did a great job of like clearing mm -hmm. the air and making it clear to me um great so you, there you you did mention a couple interesting things here um one uh was there a specific history uh period that you focused on for the history of science in your phd you not too much you know so there's basically a story that there um sort of in the 1960s and 70s there was a little bit of a trend for thinking that it was valuable to kind of look at the history of science and the philosophy of science together this partly goes back to um thomas kuhn's fam famous work the structure of scientific revolutions um and so anyway so so the the program that i was in was a history and philosophy of science program um but really um in order to kind of help people get jobs, they really you know, had people focus more on the history side or the philosophy side so you could actually get a job Got in it. a history department or a philosophy department. So I was just getting the basic gist of the history. Um, I really don't feel like a very competent historian of science. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. I, I thought um, I do like that combination. Um, I'm a big fan. I mean, that's kind of like this. The A big part of this podcast is being interdisciplinary. I think there's a lot of value in that. But at the end of the day, you do have to have like a, a definite competence too. And I under like, yeah. especially when you, you know, getting a job is important last time I checked. Yes. So that makes sense. But um, I love your point about interdisciplinarity. That's actually another theme of my work. I, I, one of the things I love about philosophy is the potential to sort of range across a, a number of issues. And I think philosophy sometimes at its best is a way of like you know, sort of linking between disciplines and again thinking about these big questions that cut across them so i love i've got you know some collaborations with some scientists some social scientists and actually a lot of this values in science literature connects up a lot with sociology of science or work that sometimes oh, yeah. gets called kind of you know science technology and society um that kind of stuff um mm. so there's just so it's so much fun to be able to connect across some of these different fields
okay, this is just a selfish question, but when you talk about science, technology, and society, is there a name for that field or is that is that the name for the field? That is, sometimes it's also called science and technology studies. Um, it tends to be abbreviated STS. So there are some great departments like Harvard has a very strong STS program. Cornell has a well-known STS program. So there are various um, places. And again, it kind of, it, it comes probably most centrally out of sociology of science, but it kind of brings in some elements of science communication, some perspectives and philosophy. And, you know, and it's thinking about these issues of, you know, contemporary science that matters to society, um, you know, looking at, you know, how these technologies develop, how certain kinds of science and technology serve some people's interests and not others. Um, you know, just lots of interesting issues that intersect with this values and science stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I'm always looking for uh, new guests, but also I'm, I've been fascinated by the creation of new disciplines, ones that aren't uh, what I would say traditional. Uh, I just had a guest on um, uh, Rebe Dr. Rebecca Lave out of uh, Indiana, yes. uh, and she did critical physical geography, and I'd never heard of that before. And uh, my ignorance showed in the interview, but I learned so much. And it's it's so important, right? Like when you talk about that confluence of social issues with environmental issues, um, she drew such clear lines between all those things. And uh, so I, I'll definitely look into some guests from from that field as well. Uh, you're science you're very perceptive, by the way. Um, Lave is pretty close to that kind of STS feel, actually. So that kind of gives you a, a bit of a feel for it. I can give you some suggestions. There are uh, one or two people I'm especially uh, fond of in that uh, in that field. So, oh, absolutely. I'll definitely uh, ask you about those later. The yeah. um, as so. When we talk about values in science, you kind of broke it up into uh, just a clear set of like kind of a chain of questions, right? Um, you know, you talk the, the first question, and I, this is where I think it's just really good for people who are first beginning to think about this. Because of the way science is taught, at least, you know, maybe this, maybe it's, uh, I'm a, you know, kind of like an 80s baby, and I think I got kind of the last tail end of like, valueless silent science right i think maybe kids today get a different education but w when you talk about uh our values always present in science um can you explain uh and give some examples of why <laughs> values are always present in science because i found your explanations very clear and lucid yeah actually a great point i don't think you should feel too bad like you got some sort of misleading impression in the 80s because actually i still think that, you know, in, in some ways, a lot of the folks writing in this area see themselves as kind of countering a misconception that science should be value free. Um, and so I think that, um, it, but once one ends up exploring this question more carefully, you end up realizing, wow, this actually gets complicated and there are a lot of dimensions to it. So, you know, so the, the temptation to say that science should be value free, I think, you know, one can see the appeal to it. Um, that you know we don't want scientists to be engaging in what some people would call wishful thinking just saying hey i'd really like it if such and such were the case and so i'm just going to say that and so we don't want scientists you know doing their work saying you know say some environmentally oriented scientist just saying well because i don't really like pesticides i'm just going to conclude that pesticides cause terrible harm to, to everything um you know we, we want scientists to be appealing to the evidence um and so in that right. respect we we there are certain ways in which values can influence science that we don't want to play out so i think that's kind of the the, the root of this kind of value free ideal as some people have called it but once you start exploring more carefully you realize well, there are a lot of ways in which values clearly do play a role in science and in which we want values to play a role in science. So um, you can start out by thinking, well, you know, it kind of makes sense that um, we want scientists to be pursuing questions and topics that serve society. And so in that respect, our values about what we think matters as a society, 
should influence science. So I have this case study at the beginning of my book about COVID. Um, and the thought is, you know, we wanted scientists because we have this value of public health and not having people die. We want scientists to go steering toward investigating COVID when we have a serious epidemic. And, um, you know, when we're deciding how much money to spend on different, you know, sort of diseases, you know, our social values should probably be relevant to saying, well, how harmful are these diseases? How you know worried are we? You know, what should we invest in? And then when we're trying to think, well, you know, how much money would we like to put into high energy particle physics as opposed to anthropology or, you know, biomedical research? Our values do seem pretty relevant. So so that's clearly a way in which values become relevant. And then when you think about it, values also become relevant to how we apply our science. So, you know, say we find out that, uh, again, back to the COVID case, since I started the book with that, and lots of people have been thinking about it. Some folks may be turned off, like, right. I'm sick of hearing about COVID, but I'll, I'll just go ahead. <laughs> Example, um, you know, um, say you're a leader of a government and you're trying to decide, okay, should I institute a particular lockdown policy or a particular, you know, mask mandate or something like that? Um, the scientists can come and tell you, look, if you engage in this lockdown policy, you're probably going to save this many lives. Um, and if you engage in this lockdown policy, you may cause this amount of like mental health problems for kids who can't go to school. And you're maybe going to cause, you know, this impact on the economy. But then we have to use our values to decide, OK, well, weighing these different consequences of, you know, saving lives, mental health costs, though, effects on the economy, our values are relevant to deciding, well, do we want to institute the lockdown or not? So, so values are clearly relevant to applying the science. And values are clearly relevant to when we're doing our science thinking, well, is it okay to like, actually deliberately expose people who have been vaccinated to COVID to try to, you know, do a study that way? Or is that ethically unacceptable? So it's also relevant to how we do the science. And then where it gets really interesting, and this is where the philosophers have done their most thinking, even when you're actually doing your scientific reasoning from evidence to conclusions, could values ever play a role there? And that's where it gets sticky because that's where it can turn into wishful thinking. And, um, and philosophers yeah. are very interested in these questions about, you know, drawing conclusions from evidence. And so that's where I spend a good chunk of the middle part of the book asking that question. Should values even play a role in our scientific reasoning, if you will? So anyway, that's my sort of quick and dirty summary. But it's clear, even if you don't buy values playing a role in scientific reasoning, there's a ton of aspects of science where values clearly do enter in. Yeah, and I, I think once you explained it, it's very obvious. And I think one of the things, even using the COVID example, uh, one of the things that people may stumble over is, well, it's obvious that we should we should start you know, dealing with COVID. It's like, yeah, but that's still a value judgment, it's, right? Like you took, you took researchers from, you know, cancer or yeah. whatever else they were working on. And it's still a value judgment, even if it's just a very yes. obvious one. And so and, oh, I was just going to say, ahead. and what's interesting is there have been people who have even questioned whether our broader social values should play a role there. There, there was a debate earlier in the 20th century about whether really the direction of science should be steered solely based on scientists in those disciplines deciding like what would lead to like the 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 the, the next discoveries say um and so you know even the idea that our social values should play a role in this while it seems pretty obvious some folks haven't been so sure about it yeah, but even if you decided to go with scientists deciding you're you're making value judgments about scientific yes. discovery right and so that's very clear. And that's and I appreciate as you moved into the book. The one that's sticky is, of course, like when you're yeah. doing science and even having that framework. Um, it's just one of those. Uh, it's wonderful to have that vocabulary of there's managing yeah. science, there's steering science, there's doing science and yeah. there's using yeah. science. Right. And these are all just very valuable ways of thinking about it. Um, of course, I would say probably that the managing and doing uh, is a you really need to, uh, people don't know the history. I think a lot of times uh, I actually just had someone on um, uh, Paul Craddock. Uh, I had on talking about the history of transplant mm. surgeries. 
And that was, I was like, oh, this is going to be really interesting. He did kind of like a history of medicine and different models of the body. I was like, oh, the great questions. And then I was just horrified. I mean, he didn't like dwell on the gory bits, but like the, the, the absolute trashing of bodily autonomy throughout history when it, you know, when you, I'm like, oh, science has been pushed forward in terrible ways when you go back through the history of it. And it's actually re- a lot of the things that we take for granted. And I, I think we should take for granted as like, the, this should be the baseline, like bodily autonomy, that sort of thing, uh, are relatively recent inventions when you look at, uh, how like we deal with the ethics yeah, of science. Um, yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> and, um, and, and I would note that, um, you know, often we go back and like sort of point out the crazy things the Nazis did, you know, in World War II and, you know, sort of how right. that spurred a lot of, you know, bioethical, you know, innovation. But then when you read more, you realize, whoa, the U.S. was doing some pretty crazy stuff during the Cold War as well with, you know, experiments with, you know, radiation on folks. And, you know, we've got the classic Tuskegee experiments, mm. you know, you know, not, um, you know, providing help to, you know, these black men with, with syphilis that were being studied. And, um, and, and, and even at present, you know, there continue to be really sticky issues with, you know, sort of global medical trials, you know, what kinds of trials are appropriate to do often in, you know, countries in the global South where, you know, we, you know, aren't providing them the kind of standard of care that we would expect in other contexts in some of these trials. So anyway, there's tons that could be said there. So I, I love that you brought that up. Uh, yeah. And, it, and there, there's other, it's kind of a side note and I don't know that we have time to get into it, but uh, even as far as inventions go, uh, understanding that, um, you know, people talk about the moral and immoral nature of mm. instruments, whether like, you know, mm. or amoral, you know, like uh, when you so, for instance, discovering nuclear power. You can talk about that, but the science behind creating a nuclear weapon has a morality to it. <laughs> you know, when you get into the more application sides of side of it, you know, um, and, and it's not uh yeah, you know, when you look at different the when, the different application side of, of science, it's, it definitely becomes clear that certain things, while you may or may not use them, and that depends on your own morality, they are only created for one specific purpose. So, for instance, a hunting rifle versus a fifty cal, without getting into mm-hmm. gun control and the, you know, in the nitty gritty, but like a fifty caliber machine gun really only has one use, and that's why it's been created. And so, it's not that it's a moral agent, but it has been created with yes. a moral intention. Um, and so I, I think that's a, a, a piece that people, uh, that, this is what I love about philosophy is just digging a couple layers deeper in these kinds of discussions where we, we can skip over some of the uh, dead ends that, that can occur um, in, in uh, even our political discourse or in our, our personal thinking and our uh, own moral thinking. Um, so we, we've talked a little bit about how values always, uh, always present in science, whether that's in more obvious ways or not. Um, and we talked a little bit about how values influence science. Uh, you talk a little bit about, should we deliberately introduce values and what is the, what are the arguments yeah, uh, about yeah. that? And maybe it would be worth also, you know, noting, you know, once again, folks working in this literature are pretty conscious of kind of the distinction between making descriptive claims and normative claims. So, you know, it's pretty much everybody is right. going to agree. Yeah. Scientists are influenced by values. Um, but where it gets really interesting philosophically right. is that normative claim of, you know, well, you, you could say, yeah, they're influenced, but let's try our best to clear them out. And what's really been going on in the um, you know, past you know, 20, 30 years is a lot more reflection among philosophers of science about, well, should um, the scientists allow values to influence them at times? And so I go through in that part of the book, um, four different arguments that one could give for saying, actually, you know, it's appropriate to, um, to, in certain cases, in certain ways, we can get at that to bring values into science. I think one of the most intuitive ones that um, is maybe nice to start off with is an argument th- that was, you know, kind of developed a bit in the 1950s. And then a philosopher named Heather Douglas 
really um, sort of focused more on the argument and, and sharpened it in some really cool ways um, in an article in 2000. And she wrote a book, um, Science, Policy, and the Value-Free Ideal, that was published in 2009. And um, so she develops this argument that I kind of called the error argument, which is the idea that when you're doing science, you know, there are no guarantees that you are correct. No matter how much evidence it seems like you've got, you know, there's a potential that you could be wrong. So you're engaging in inductive reasoning. You're, you're gathering evidence, trying to draw a conclusion. And so there's this risk if you, say, accept some new claim, like, you know, both um, Heather Douglas and I think a lot about, like, dealing with, um, you know, environmental pollution and, you know, toxic chemicals and things like that. So say you've got some chemical and you're trying to figure out, you know, is this going to harm people or not? Um, on the one hand, you could say, yeah, I think the evidence suggests that it's going to be harmful. And so you draw this conclusion, you could call it a positive conclusion, but you could be wrong. It could be a false positive where it's, you're actually not right about that. Or it could be that you say, no, I don't think the evidence is such that this is harmful. And once again, you could be an error, you know, with this inductive inference, it could be a false negative. <laughs> and so anyway, what Douglas points out is when you make these errors, there are costs, there are consequences to making these errors in most areas of science. Um, but especially when you're doing science that's, you know, relevant for decision making. And so she says, really, you know, if science scientists are like everybody else in society where they have certain moral obligations to think about the effects of what they're doing. And so she says scientists have an ethical obligation to consider, well, what would be the consequences of drawing a false positive conclusion and saying this chemical is harmful when it's not, or drawing a false negative conclusion and saying it's not harmful when it really is. And so she says that you know, if the consequences of drawing a, a, a false positive would be really bad, well, then maybe you should increase your amount of evidence you require before you're willing to draw that conclusion. Um, and if, on the other hand, a false negative would be really terrible, well, maybe you should lower your evidence so you're not sticking with that negative so much and go ahead and say, well, maybe there is enough evidence. So her point is that values, our ethical obligations, our thinking about the consequences of our conclusions are relevant to deciding how much evidence you should demand before you draw a conclusion. And a lot of folks who think about this will point out that scientists tend to really not like making false positive errors. They don't tend to like going out on a limb and saying, yeah, this is the case. They tend to be cautious, but there may be some consequences where there's that's not so appropriate. And it's actually very interesting to consider when science is used in the legal context that, you know, the law and lawyers are tend to be very thoughtful about how much evidence you need in order to, you know, find somebody like guilty, the idea you need evidence beyond a reasonable doubt in criminal cases. But what's fascinating is in civil, like tort cases, where you're trying to sue a company, they say, you don't need evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. You only need a preponderance of evidence, just over like 51%. And so, again, it's pointing out, depending on the consequences in the legal setting, they want different levels of evidence. And so Douglas says, you know, maybe, you know, scientists need to keep that in mind. So, so that's maybe the, the first most obvious argument that can maybe get people started. But, and I know I've just been going on this long rant. Um, should I continue with any other arguments? No, that's no, great. <laughs> I, well, I, I would love to give maybe an earthy example that people uh, can even uh, relate to. Um, I, I think we all understand the increasing yeah. threshold of evidence with increasing yes. the the consequences. So, for instance, if you've ever, um, you know, I, if I'm talking to my wife and uh, she's like, did you roll up the windows on the car? It's about to storm. And uh, if she doesn't add, you know, it's about to storm, I might be like, oh, yeah, definitely. And then and then when she's like, oh, it's time, like, there's going to be a storm. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go back yes. out and check. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, uh, and it's it's very, uh, I think that the whole idea of understanding that when you draw conclusions, there are consequences. And I understand it's beyond the purview of this, but just watching, um, uh, I don't, are you familiar <laughs> with uh, Hank Green? Uh, he's like a, He's a YouTube uh, kind of educator, does free education. Uh, they do like crash course and stuff like that. Um, but uh, he was talking, <laughs> he was showing how uh, 
scientists will take something and they will publish a finding and then journalists will take that and write a <laughs> write a different headline that like you can't be sued for <laughs> for libel <laughs> but it really should be able to it's so misleading and so there's always that um understanding that whatever you say uh people are going to take and probably misuse and that's not entirely your fault but there's also just being very cautious yes. about the consequences uh of making I these claims that. Um, and, and it's so actually that whole dynamic of scientists yeah. and journalists and so on is an issue I get into a little bit in the Tapestry of Values book where I, there's a lot of relevance of values to science communication, you know, where and basically Douglas is getting at that with this issue of when do you draw a conclusion, but also how you frame the information, um, right. you know, what conceptual categories you use. Um, you know, do you say in medicine, do you use racial categories given that that can have sort of benefits in terms of highlighting like disparities, but also negative consequences in terms of maybe giving more of an impression that these racial categories are more biologically significant than they are. Um, and actually, it, this also leads into another one of my arguments. So if you don't mind, I could give another argument for, but why don't you, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I, I was just going to say, before you do that, I realized I jumped the gun a little bit because I did want to ask you to explain um, epistemic versus non-epistemic because I think that plays into this. And I, I'm familiar a little bit with Thomas Kuhn's work, but I was not familiar with the value of fertility. Can you explain some of those uh, epistemic and non-epistemic values and explain? Yeah, I was shocked to see fertility under epistemic. But maybe uh, I, I could see how it would fit there, but I don't. Yeah, it, it yeah. was not immediately. And so obvious this gets to me. back to some of the more philosophical details that I got into at the beginning of the book, and and that I tried to skip a little bit in Tapestry of Values because I thought my audience just might not have the patience for it. But uh, but <laughs> yes, um, to put it briefly, <laughs> um, so in this kind of softening up, if you will, um, toward the idea that well, maybe values do have a role to play mm -hmm. in science, um, and some of Thomas Kuhn's later work and others. They pointed out that, you know, at the very least, scientific reasoning isn't like an algorithm where it's just rules, where you can just follow the rules and say, okay, given this evidence, this is the conclusion. You know, there are there there needs to be sort of a weighing sometimes of considerations. Um, and so folks like Kuhn pointed out that it, this is a way in which values play a role in science, but it doesn't have to be like what we might typically think of as like ethical or social values that one scientist might say, well, this is a really good theory because it provides such a nice explanation of the phenomena. But another scientist might say, well, yeah, but it doesn't cover as many phenomena as this other theory. And this theory you know, really predicts well. And so you could have one theory that seems like it's providing a better explanation and another theory that seems like it's got more predictive power, at least for the moment, or more predictive accuracy. In some ways, this is where my history may not be the best, so we've got to be careful about who's watching your podcast. But I think this was the case early <laughs> on with the debate between um, Copernican astronomy and the old Ptolemaic system, where you know Copernicus actually was offering a really a potentially a, a better explanatory picture. But at that time, I think the Ptolemaic system, they had developed it so carefully, it was more predictively accurate. And so the scientists are having to decide, well, which is better? So anyway, that's a long-winded way of saying, even if you don't buy the idea that ethical and social values have a role to play in science, scientists still are employing what you might call epistemic values, meaning ep these epistemic values are ones that help us to get at the truth or to get at reliable information. And so you could say, yeah, scientists value that their theories should be predictive. They value that their theories should explain things. They value that the theories should cover a lot of phenomena. and the idea of fertility, they value the, the idea that their theories should help to sort of launch further understanding uh, of, of information. So it's fertility in the sense of okay. helping us to move forward, almost like back to our idea of discovery before. That makes um, sense. And so then the non-epistemic values would be ones that you know aren't sort of helping you to get at the truth or aren't indicators of the truth. And so that seems a little bit more controversial because you might say, well, if science is all about getting at the truth, why should we be bringing in these values that don't help us get there? Um, so that's, uh, you know, we can say a little bit more about that when we give some more arguments for bringing them in. Right. 
Well, and that's where we talked about even uh, whether we talk about doing or using, certainly for managing and steering those non-epistemic values. Uh, we've already talked about those playing out. Uh, yes. And I, I apologize for pulling us back. I realized I did want to cover that. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, please talk about the other arguments for. Um, yeah. Uh, it deliberately and as I get values. started on that, uh -huh. I should note, um, you very helpfully use the terms that I use in a particular figure in the book um, that I'm not sure I use the terms when I was initially describing. So like when you were saying steering science, this is the idea that values could influence what we study. Um, doing science was my term for the idea that values could play a role in actual scientific reasoning. And then using science was the idea of, you know, how we actually values playing a role in using science and then managing these sort of ethical restrictions on how science gets done. So just want to be sure for the audience, you know, if they um, that they know what we're talking about there. So so back to these arguments that values should play a role in how we do science or in scientific reasoning. When I was talking about the science communication with you and like the framing of information. So another argument is that the categories and the terms that science use, I call this the conceptual argument, that when you think about it, that these are typically value, or maybe not typically, I leave that for others to consider, but they sure can be value laden <laughs> in the sense that they serve some values versus others, or you might purposely be using particular terms because of this way in which they serve values. So like, say in economics, um, you are trying to figure out the unemployment rate you've got to figure out, well, how do we define unemployment? Who's unemployed? Does it include people who don't have a job and aren't looking for a job? Or is it only the people who are actually looking for a job? And it gets into, I'm no economist, but you know this stuff gets really complicated. And it has a very practical implication because if you define it in one way, you make unemployment look a lot worse than if you define it in another way. Um, and so anyway, and even terms, Back to the COVID case, you may remember, you know, President Trump was, you know, calling this the Chinese virus sometimes and so on. You know, it clearly can have stigmatizing effects. Um, you know, the World Health Organization ultimately decided to start using Greek letters. And that's why we're calling things the Delta variant and the Omicron variant um, because of the potential for, you know, stigmatizing of, you know, particular places if you're naming variants after things. You mentioned earlier briefly gun control. Um, you know, even whether you're using, you know, if you're doing your science and you're talking about gun control versus gun regulation or gun safety, you know, the more you look at it, the terms we use and the way we define our categories and so on are just full of values. And so I argue in both Tapestry and this most recent book that it's pretty unrealistic to think that you could just have totally value neutral terminology. You're just about forced to use language and definitions that privilege some values versus others. And so rather than thinking, I'm going to keep my science value free, um, maybe it makes more sense to say, yeah, I'm using particular terms and categories that serve some values versus others. Let me try to be acknowledge that. Let me try to be thoughtful about what I'm doing here. But it's kind of silly to think that that aspect of science can just be value free. So that that's a second argument. Which I think it's, uh, there's, in my mind at least, being more explicit about where you're coming from is really helpful to protect both yourself and your listeners from allowing uh, kind of bias creep, right? It's like, at least if you're honest about where, where you're coming from, then you can, ha then it's like, well, if I want to dispute yeah. this, I can talk about these biases instead of just saying like, I mean, this is what that, this is what we we've uh, if you go far enough back in, in history, it's like, uh, well, this is just obvious because we are civilized and they are primitive, you know, to use so like the very it's like um, these kind of total uh, truth ideas where it's like, oh, this is this is like this is how it is. And there is no other explanation and not looking at the way things were steered, yeah. things that were. Uh, I, I use the term with um, a colleague sometimes um, for this kind of transparency. Um, we use the term backtracking that like the idea is rather than making people think like this is how it is. This is the only way to see things. You can kind of help your listeners to backtrack and realize, oh, there are some other ways that you could think about this. We could have described it this way. We could have drawn this conclusion. Um, so it provides that opportunity to think, oh, well, given my value orientation, how might I have approached this? 
Um, and, and we can eventually, you know, this idea of transparency is one of the ways of managing values in science. So I guess we can decide I could quickly give the other two arguments for bringing in values, or we can say enough of that. We're going to bore your listeners and go on. The ropes. Okay. No, I want to hear. No, this is fascinating to me. Please. Uh, what are the yeah. other two? Yeah, I think it's that you have gap in aims, right? So we've had, we, you've covered error, you've covered uh, conceptual. Um, and I, they they seem to they, well, that's a really they, they seem yeah. to work in my mind at least but yeah i mean well, yeah <laughs> but um yeah, obviously leave that up to uh you know that's something for the listeners to decide for themselves as well yeah. um so talk to me a little bit about the the gap yeah. one that one to yeah. me i wasn't sure right, well, about so and, i am and again, i'll try to, to make it a that. little quicker since i know we probably have limited time but so this goes back especially um at least my understanding of it especially goes back to this um influential philosopher Helen Longino, who wrote this book back in 1990. It was called Science as Social Knowledge. And um, her point was that when you try to get from a particular body of evidence, or, or I guess I should say actually a particular set of data to a particular conclusion, that there always need to be some background assumptions that kind of link the data to the conclusion. So this can seem a little bit complicated and abstract, but um, you know, I like to think of it as say you have some data, you've got to decide, well, you know, you know, was the method through which these data were collected, was it reliable? Um, are there other like confounding factors that we should have, you know, been sort of testing for? I mean, that's some of the most obvious, easiest to understand, I think, ways of thinking about this. So the idea is you don't just have data count as evidence for a particular hypothesis or theory independent of some other background assumptions. And so she says that those background assumptions are almost always kind of value laden in the sense that you could choose different background assumptions. And again, different background assumptions may be either kind of motivated by particular values or they serve particular values and so on. And, and in principle, somebody might say, well, look, why don't we just go collect some evidence and for the background assumptions? You know, we don't have to just accept them, you know, uh, but but then this can get complicated where people can disagree on how well the evidence supports the background assumptions. And sometimes we have to draw a conclusion before we have time to I feel like, you know, in most interesting debates in science, you know, you're choosing between a couple interpretations of the available data. And we don't know exactly which background assumptions are better than, you know, different scientists are debating. And um, so anyway, so that's the idea of the gap argument. You have a gap there that has to be filled by assumptions that are likely to be valued. And for me, that kind of strikes a chord from uh, philosophical hermeneutics with people struggling with the idea of how finite they really are. Right. It's like, well, why don't you just keep researching? And it's like. Well, <laughs> we only yes. have so much money and we only have so much time and so much manpower. And like at some point yes. you have to draw a conclusion or you'll never get anywhere. Um, so that, yeah, that, thank you. That aims. helps a lot. And, and, and then, this uh, is something the last that I've been thinking aims. about more myself yeah, yeah. Um, is that at least in it. So this gets into really interesting, bigger questions that we don't have to sort of focus on here. But it gets into the question of, well, is it actually the case that science just has this like one overarching aim of arriving at the truth or you know is science actually done for more practical purposes we're trying to make our way in the world and our science is to kind of help us in making our way and and so um i think where this can get especially interesting i find is thinking about like public policy or regulations and so on where you know it may be back to your point about we don't have forever um Often policymakers are trying to make decisions in a sort of a reasonable length of time. Back to my interest in environmental pollution, you know, we have thousands, tens of thousands of industrial chemicals in use. And we actually don't know a whole lot about very many of them. Um, you know, it's not like we require all these companies to do a zillion tests before they can put these things on the market. And, you know, again, that's a matter of values. We've valued innovation. Um, but anyway, so when you're a regulator and you're trying to decide, OK, well, what counts as good science here? Is it the very best, most exact stuff or, you know, in this context, 
Does good science count as some kind of rough and ready ways to assess some risks of these chemicals? We may be wrong a lot, you know, but at least we're getting some rough and ready sense of how harmful these chemicals are. So it's this thought that, well, we need to think about what our aims are in particular contexts. And sometimes we have aims back to the question of should we just consider epistemic values? Well, my suggestion is sometimes we have aims that involve more than the epistemic. We're trying to get results efficiently. We're trying to do our science in like standardized ways so that regulators can all talk to each other, you know, and so on. And so the idea that our, our non-epistemic aims may justify non-epistemic values sometimes in uh, deciding what counts as good science. Even that example you just gave, I mean, uh, we're normally aiming to fix an issue when we're researching in science. Like there's very, very little pure research. Uh, and the example that you gave, I immediately thought of uh, the the kind of action that Dr. Uh, Lave in critical physical geography is asking for. Yes, uh, I don't yes. know if you're familiar with the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. So I, I, I had not heard of that. And I'm not gonna lie. It was terrifying. The idea that there are chemicals pouring in and it's literally stripped the oxygen from the water so that fish die if they they're in there. Yes. And it's about the size of Rhode Island. You know, it's like I and it's like, oh, so, you know, I, that would set the parameters and the threshold for figuring out, um, you know, things about industrial chemicals that are going in there. It's so like how like exactly. You, that, and I love that you bring that up because problem. in my tapestry of values um, <laughs> book, I actually, in one of my chapters, I refer to a case study involving some of her work. Um, so it's hilarious that you, you bring that up because right, when you're oh. doing that kind of practical work for regulatory purposes, you've got to consider, well, what are our goals? And that can influence sort of in some ways, you know, how we do our science, what models we choose, you know, what uh, methods and so on. Yeah. And there's so, there's so many places we could go with even this discussion, but I, I do want to be respectful of your yeah. time. How do we promote responsible values? And, and, you know, you talk about ethical reasoning and political reasoning. And uh, so tell us a little bit about how we can wisely yeah. choose. And this values is an area where I think it's science. kind of the cutting edge of the field right now where people have now, you know, not everybody agrees, but at least the philosophers work in this area kind of say, yeah, actually, at least in some cases, non-epistemic values probably have a role to play, even in the doing of science and scientific reasoning. But boy, we have to be careful how this gets done, because it could easily become irresponsible. And so um, there, I have to just be honest that there are differing views about how to handle this. You know, we were talking earlier about the value of transparency or openness about the values that are influencing one's science. So one of the things I've written about a bit is this notion of transparency, that maybe if one is honest enough about saying, okay, we had to make a choice here about how to interpret the available evidence. We had to choose which model we were going to use. We chose this one. Um, and this has these implications. You know, it tends to, you know, if we're wrong, it would tend to overestimate the problem rather than if you chose this approach, it would underestimate the problem. Um, that kind of transparency can then allow others who might have different values to be able to say, OK, well, you know, I can trust your science. It matches my values or, well, maybe I might draw a different conclusion. Um, so I think that's one powerful approach. Um, unsurprisingly, not all my colleagues are in love with that solution. And and I acknowledge it has some weaknesses as well. Yeah. <laughs> what? I know. It's, it's other funny. philosophers yeah. <laughs> disagreeing. I can't believe it. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so, I mean, there are various worries um, about this. You know, ahead. one is, you know, the extent to which we can be fully transparent about all these value influences is questionable, the extent to which we can recognize, you know, what's going on, you know, and so on. And even the way we describe, you know, it, in terms of trying to be transparent, I've argued actually is sort of against myself a little bit, at least complicating things that, you know, even the way in which you engage in transparency can be value laden insofar as, you know, you're being more or less open, how you frame it and so on. So there are some other suggestions people have. We mentioned Helen Longino and her gap argument and this idea that, you know, these background assumptions invariably will play a role. Well, she had a really nice point that maybe um, given that individuals may not fully recognize the background assumptions they're making, um, that she argued that scientific objectivity actually needs to come at the community level 
where you have different scientists with different background assumptions who can kind of recognize each other's and say, ooh, you're making a crucial assumption here. And so she would argue that one of the aspects to handling values in science responsibly is to foster diversity in the scientific community and to have the right kind of critical engagement between these scientists. So you have opportunities to critically evaluate what each other is saying and highlight these different assumptions. So that's another suggestion. I could say more, but maybe I should just stop for just a sec in case you want to jump in. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I actually have, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know if you knew Dr. Chris Halfa on, um, and he, and so it was interesting because we talked about how science progresses. And one of the points that he made was very similar that science progresses at the communal level because one study is almost never enough. And you have to have that study peer reviewed, right? You want multiple eyes on it. And definitely, um, and that, which just kind of supports that, uh, that whole idea of like science takes time. And that's something that, you know, even when you're talking about COVID 19, one of the things that I think made such a, a mess of that in public is people don't understand yeah. how science works and how long it takes to do things. And so they were confused, like, like, shouldn't we know this already? Yeah. And it's like, and the no, idea that's, that you that's can not have a reasonable disagreement works. that, you know, right? you shouldn't expect right away for all the scientists to come yeah. to the same conclusion. The data can be complicated to interpret. And it, it's totally understandable that when you have emerging science, that different scientists may disagree. And we need thoughtful ways for the, the public and for policymakers to, to make decisions, not always expecting all the scientists to be agreeing. Yeah, absolutely. Is there, is there a last yeah, maybe uh, I can just one that you would want to cover before we I'm being sneaky kind of here. Up? I'm going to quickly try to slide in two. Um, <laughs> so one thought would be, no, no. well, you just need go, to pick great. the right <laughs> values to influence all these judgments. So either you do some kind of ethical analysis and you decide, okay, well, the most important value to prioritize here is like public health or economic development. And then we're going to make our judgments in ways that tend to serve that value. And this could apply to epistemic values as well. You could say, okay, well, the most important value is explanatory power. And we're going to, you know, like choose the theory that serves that or something like that. And then I was just going to say, in addition to that idea of like, you could choose the right values, you could also say, well, maybe part of managing the values is to say certain kinds of value influences are appropriate and other kinds aren't. So this would be for those who want to maintain, you know, like who, who still feel somewhat fond of the value free ideal, you could say, well, yeah, there are certain ways values could influence science that just aren't OK. Like you just can't use your values to like just you know, to, to do something fraudulent where you make up data or something like that, or, or, or back to Heather Douglas, you know, she said, <laughs> you shouldn't use values as if they were a form of evidence where you say, yeah, well, because of this value, I think this theory is true. You just use the values to set your standards of evidence to say how much you need before you draw a conclusion. So anyway, those are some other options. So there's right. lots of discussion at this point. Yeah. But well, again, that seems reasonable. Philosophers, they'll disagree with anything. You'll there, there there are folks who will say that sounds reasonable, <laughs> but it's more complex than you think. <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah. No, I mean I this is this is me doing uh, an episode on it and listen like that seems reasonable and then someone who's been studying it for 20 years is like like you're an idiot and i'm like well i I'm, I'm not gonna disagree with you um uh if you could if um if there was one thing you would want to leave Boy. our listeners with what would it be oh man i should have done a one better job away. of thinking about this beforehand this is a lot of responsibility um you know i think it would be i feel like in our contemporary world um science plays a significant role. You know, we see with COVID, you know, how much science impacted things. And I think that it's really important for your listeners, for all of us to understand that, that science is, is complicated, that we shouldn't expect science to just give sort of a single unitary, you know, sort of answer to everything all the time. Um, and that it's okay. And that doesn't mean that science isn't like just our, our best way of getting at information about the world. And so um, here I'm being a lame philosopher and you wanted you know, one quick answer and I'm you know, sort of wandering on. But the point is, science is complicated. We shouldn't expect everything no, to be this all the is same. Great. Science is, is awesome. 
It's, you know, a great way to learn about the world. And so we need to find ways to be thoughtful when we're engaging in decision making to deal with sort of the messiness of science. And we just see this everywhere. We see this with climate change. We see this with, you know, sort of decision making around COVID and so on, that we need to be able to thoughtfully say, okay, there's some disagreement, but we can still make some reasonable decisions and, you know, actually get things done appealing to the science and, um, you know, not assume that it's always going to be some simple consensus or just because one scientist has some differing views, oh, then we can't take action and so on. So anyway, that's kind of a roundabout way to uh, maybe draw a lesson. No, I think I think that's a, a great place to leave our listeners. Uh, Dr. Elliot, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Really appreciate it.